Well, good morning and welcome to another edition of the Morning Devotional. My name is Pastor William Hill. I am the pastor of Providence Church, a congregation of the Presbyterian Church in America. It's great to have you here with me for a special edition of the Morning Devotional. We're going to set aside the Shorter Catechism just for one day. And I just want to uh, spend a, a few moments talking about a subject that seems uh, in our world today uh, has uh, fallen on hard times. I, I'm not sure the reasons as to why that is the case. Um, I suspect I could come up with a bunch of them um, uh, with the understanding that there, uh, there's no way for me to root out uh, all of the ins and outs of uh, the issue that relates to the prayer meeting, and that is, of course, the public gathering of God's people for the specific purpose to pray as God's people for the needs of the world, the church, our brothers and sisters, and whatever. Let's pray first, and then I'm just going to do a survey through this subject and offer some, I hope, some pastoral and practical suggestions as by ways in which we can change this, um, this, uh, this issue. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, as we come before you uh, this morning, we come with the understanding that you have granted to us the glorious privilege of prayer, and we would pray that you would help us as we seek to understand your word, as we seek to consider these matters, that you'd grant us your spirit, that you would make us a praying people. Forgive us for our prayerless prayers and help us that we might, as your people, have a zeal, a desire to gather as your people to pray and to plead with the God of heaven. Be gracious to us, we ask for Christ's sake. Amen. I just want to read a story that was told. Um, I got this from another source. I don't remember exactly where, but the story goes like this. There are so many examples of how corporate prayer was the springboard for the sweeping movements of God. Let me mention a few. In 1857, America was riding the wave of a strong economy and, as tends to be true in times of prosperity, showed a radical decrease of interest in the things of God. There was a layman named Jeremiah Lamphere whose concern led to a call for prayer. He tacked up notices in New York City calling for a weekly prayer meeting on Wednesdays from noon till 1 at a rented space on Fulton Street. The first prayer meeting was on September 23, 1857. Only six people came, and they didn't arrive until just before 1230. The next week, the attendance jumped to 20. The numbers continued to climb week by week. Then on October 10th, the stock market crashed and a financial panic ensued. Trouble had its humbling effect, and the hearts of many turned to spiritual matters. It wasn't long until somewhere between 10 and 50,000 businessmen were meeting every day in New York City to pray at noon. By week 15, the meetings moved from weekly to daily. In 1858, this prayer movement leaped to every major city in America. The Second Great Awakening swept our land. Estimates are that a million Americans out of a population of 30 million at that time were converted in less than two years. And it all started with prayer. Now, I don't need to tell you that we live in very difficult days and trying times in our world. Our economy is in peril. Uh, the nation itself, at least the United States, is more divided than I can ever, have, I ever remember it. Now, granted, I'm 55 years old, and some of you are much older than me and can remember more difficult things, but I have never seen a nation so divided. We live in perilous times on the morality front, from the issue of homosexuality, to abortion, uh, to woke theology, to critical race theory, to the social gospel, to the plummeting numbers that exist within our churches all across this land, to the drop in, of those who would actually say that the Bible is God's word. We live in trying times indeed. But it seems that in these trying times, the number of people that gather each week to take advantage of the means of grace, at least one of them, and that is the corporate gathering of God's people to pray, has plummeted as well. And I suspect there is a correlation. Now, I recognize logically that causation, correlation does not equal causation. But it does seem to me, at least, 
that when God's people, especially God's people, will not make effort to carve and schedule their week in such a way that they make as a priority the corporate gathering of God's people, the results are obvious. And I think we're living in those results. We're living in the consequences of the behavior of God's people in this nation. Certainly there are other factors contributing to the problems that exist within our social structure and our social sphere. But the absence of God's people on a weekly basis to pray for the needs of the church and the needs of the world, the nation and our leaders and frankly it confounds normal and reasonable thinking. I know that we have excuses, we have reasons, we have many things that are going on in our lives and some of those are providentially ordered and some of those are legitimate. In my own church we have people that work midnights. We gather for prayer on Wednesday nights, they're sleeping and they should be because they need to go earn their daily bread. But there are others uh, in churches all over our country in which people just don't prioritize their week in such a way that they're able to be in attendance. Uh, instead of bringing or coming and bringing their children with them to pray together with the people of God and model that by example, uh, that very important duty and privilege we opt out for other things and we place other things that do not have anywhere near the value or the importance of gathering with the people of God to pray. So let me just give some uh, pointers, some, uh, some guidance uh, on this subject. Um, it, it is one that, um, well, we must take seriously. First, we need to note that corporate prayer is on par with preaching and teaching as a priority in a healthy church. It was Charles Haddon Spurgeon that tr contributed his, his, the fruit of his preaching to the hundreds of people that would pray for him while he was preaching. How many times have I heard in seminary that as I work on sermons, I need to bathe my sermons in prayer? How often do I covet the prayers of God's people at my own church as I work on sermons? How often do I ask for that on our prayer list each week? Indeed, a prayerless pastor will lead to a powerless prayer preaching. Prayer and preaching are not antithetical. They are not in competition with each other. No, they go hand in hand. Corporate prayer is indeed on par with preaching and teaching as a priority in a healthy church. Second, praying together is a vital key to opening God's presence and work among the people in unique ways. And we have examples of this all over the Old Testament, or all over the New Testament. In fact, I might even make the argument that corporate prayer began all the way back in Genesis. And at the end of, um, well, if you give me a minute, I'll find it. Here it is at the end of Genesis, uh, Genesis chapter 4. To Seth also a son was born, and he called his name Enosh. At that time, people began to call upon the name of the Lord. But we have also throughout the, the New Testament, if you're not convinced by that passage, uh, all the way through the New Testament, we have m many examples of people, the people of God gathering together and praying. Acts chapter 1 and verse 14, all these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus and his brothers. Again, in chapter 2 and verse 1, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place. And suddenly there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting. Again, in Acts 1 and verse 24, and they prayed, that is, the people there gathered in that upper room, they prayed, they prayed out loud, they prayed together. You, Lord, who knows the hearts of all, show which one of these two you have chosen. Of course, this is the prayer request for the replacement for Judas as the disciple. In Acts chapter 4 and verse at 24, we have another example. And when they heard it, that's who, who's, who's they. Uh, these are the people that were praying for Peter and John. When they heard it, they lifted their voices together to God and said, Sovereign Lord, who made the heaven and earth and the sea and everything in them, who through the mouth of our father David, your servant, said by the Holy Spirit, Why did the Gentiles rage and the people's plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers were gathered together against the Lord and against his anointed. 
For truly in the city there were gathered together against your holy servant Jesus, whom you anointed, both Herod and Pontius Pilate, along with the Gentiles and the peoples of Israel. And it goes on. The prayer continues. All being done in the corporate gathering of God's people. Acts chapter 6, and in verse 6, These they set before the apostles, and they prayed and laid their hands on them. This is the selection of the first deacons in the church. Again, a gathering, a public gathering. Acts chapter 12. Acts chapter 12, verses 1 through 11. Don't have time to read the whole thing, but again, we have an example of a public gathering of God's people. And then in Acts 13, verses 1 and 2, Now there were in the church at Antioch prophets and teachers, Barnabas, Simeon, who was called Niger, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian, a member of the court of Herod, the Tetrarch, and Saul. While they were worshiping the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Set apart for me Barnabas and Saul for the work to which I have called them. Then after fasting and praying, they laid their hands on them and sent them off. Again, a public gathering of God's people. Examples upon examples throughout church history of how revival has started through the corporate gathering of God's people. Third, prayer meeting it should not be seen as an extracurricular activity of the church. It is a public gathering of the people of God. It is a public gathering of God's people. And it should be prioritized. And I suspect, friends, that if we do not prioritize this thing, this, 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 uh, this duty, this privilege in our lives, we will continue to see the downward trend uh, in our nation and in our world. What else, is, what else is more important than gathering to pray and plead with the God of heaven with your brothers and sisters? To walk hand in hand with them as we pray together for the needs that affect our churches, our world, our nation, our leaders, our loved ones. No, indeed, corporate prayer meetings have fallen on hard times. And it is my zeal, my desire, my prayer, that as God's people, we would begin, we would make the adjustments, maybe even repent, maybe even realize that this is something that is not merely attack on to our week, but it's as important a thing that we can do. It's on par with preaching. It's on par with the teaching of the Word. God's people must pray together. We must do this if we are to see the God of heaven work as He has in the past in a powerful way to change the course of our churches and our world in which we live. Well, I trust these times are helpful for you. I hope they are. I hope you um, take to heart these matters, all of the things that are discussed, and that you will understand that even as I have used material from other sources, even in this devotional, how important this subject really is. You think on this today. If you have any comments or questions, you can leave me a note. The way to do that is there before you on the screen. So until the Friday edition, when we move back into the Shorter Catechism as we continue with Season 4. May the Lord bless you and help you today. May you be a person of prayer. May you gather with your brothers and sisters to pray. May we be a praying church to the glory of our God in heaven. God bless.